from Mark's Gospel and can be found in the Bibles in front of you on page 1002. So Mark chapter 1 from verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of God. Thank you very much, Abby, for reading. Okay, and I'm just going to find a clicker for our PowerPoint. So do turn to your neighbours again and just remind yourselves what could have been the best news that you would hear this week. Excellent. Well, I hope that's refreshed your memories. Sam asked us, and I'll ask us again, is what would be the best news you could hear? And there's an infinite number of answers to that question, isn't there? The best news you or I could hear might be that we've finally got that dream job we really, really want. It might be that we've just got that pay rise. It might be that we've got our grandchildren coming to stay for the whole weekend. It might be that we've got that amazing relationship we always wanted, or it might be that we're going to get the best grades we possibly can at school. It might be that we want a mortgage and we've just heard that we're going to get it. And whatever your answer may have been, there are lots of options to that question. What's the best news you could hear? But what actually is the best news you could ever hear? Our passage this evening has the answer to that question. It thinks the best news is that God's kingdom is coming. I'll read verses 14 and 15 again for us. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus comes onto the scene and announces the good news of God. And this good news is the fact that the time has come for God's kingdom to be made known. Have a look at verse 15 again. The good news, the best news in fact, is the arrival of God's kingdom. And it's important to realize this is not just a casual announcement. It's not like saying, ah, it's time, the time has come for us to have a haircut. Or it's not like saying, the time has finally come for the general election, it's time to vote. Um, it's, not even, um, it's not even like uh, when Donald Trump was announced president, even shocking as that was. No, Jesus is making a much bigger announcement. This world has waited years and years for this proclamation. The Israelite king, uh, King David, had been promised by God around a thousand years before that a descendant of his would have a kingdom that lasted forever. In fact, one could say that the whole of the Old Testament, that's that whole chunk on my left, your right, the whole of the Old Testament looks forward to this announcement, the coming of the kingdom of God. So if it were possible to list all the amazing announcements, all the great achievements of history, actually this would be right at the top. God's kingdom coming to earth. That's the significance of this proclamation, and it's um, true to say that the world's been waiting a long time for it. Finally, God's kingdom had been revealed. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you might have spotted that Jesus says the kingdom of God is near. He doesn't say the kingdom of God is here, which is what you'd expect. At the same time as this huge announcement of the arrival of God's kingdom, there's also a sense in which it's not fully arrived. There's a now and are not yet. It's arrived, and yet it's not been fully established. 
And we'll come back to why that is later. But for now, let's come back to what Jesus means by the kingdom of God being near. By arriving in Galilee and saying that God's kingdom is near, Jesus is in effect saying, because I am here, the kingdom of God is near. Jesus' physical bodily arrival in the world means God's kingdom is near. Now, that would be a very arrogant thing for me or for you or for anyone else to say. In fact, it would be a lie, wouldn't it? But for Jesus, it's the truth. We saw last week, if you were here, that Jesus is God's Christ. He's the chosen king. Um, He'd been promised in advance, and he finally arrived. John the Baptist had heralded him as God's king, and God's own spirit had rested upon him. And we heard back in 1, 10, and 11 that a voice from heaven declared Jesus to be God's son, the one he loves. So Jesus, God's king and his son, has the credentials. He has the credentials to announce and to bring God's kingdom. In fact, God's kingdom and God's king are so closely linked, you can't separate the two. If I were to get black and white paint and mix them up together and gave them to you and ask you to separate the black from the white, I don't think you'd be able to do it. It'd be impossible. Well, so too, you can't separate God's king from his kingdom. Therefore, if we want to know why God's kingdom, the coming of God's kingdom, is such good news, we're going to need to look at God's king. We're going to need to look at Jesus. So that's what we're going to do. Um, If we were to read on in Mark's gospel, uh, we'd encounter the real person of Jesus. And one thing becomes very clear. He has power over evil. There are four specific accounts in Mark's Gospel, I think, where Jesus casts out demons. He casts out evil spirits. And one of them's in chapter 5, where there's a man named Legion who's completely deranged. He lives in the tombs. He runs around screaming night and day, cutting himself. And he's completely out of control. No one can subdue him. But as soon as he sees Jesus coming from a distance, he runs and falls to his feet and asks if Jesus is going to come and torture him. He's afraid of him. No sooner does he come to Jesus, and Jesus casts the demons out and sends them into 2,000 pigs, which then run off the cliff bank and into the sea to drown. But amazingly, the man is fully healed. He's sitting with Jesus. Now, whatever was in that man, Jesus had authority over it. And this is just one example of where Jesus proved his authority over evil. Whatever was in that man, whatever evil spirits are, The point's clear. Jesus has complete authority over them. In fact, he has complete authority and power over the devil. Why am I telling you about this? Why why does this matter? Well, it means that in God's kingdom, where God's king reigns, there will be no evil. Between 1939 and 1945, over 6 million Jews were murdered by the Nazis in Germany. That's around the population of Bournemouth, times 33. On the 21st of April, 1994, some 45,000 Tutsis were murdered in one day while hiding in a school in Murambi in Rwanda. It's thought only 34 survived. And 22nd of May, 2017, this year, concert goers arriving at the Manchester Arena were looking forward to spending time listening to music only to be cut short by a bomb which killed 23 and injured 250 more. And those are only just a few examples of the evil that have occurred in our world. It would be all too easy to list more, wouldn't it? But in God's kingdom, there will be no evil and there will be no evil deeds. How do we know this? Well, we know this because Jesus, God's king, has authority over evil. If Jesus went about casting out evil demons, then we can be sure that there will be no evil in his kingdom. And this is brilliant news, isn't it? It's what you and I would really like for our world. It's what our world desperately needs. A world where there is no evil, where genocide, murder do not exist. In God's kingdom, the 22nd of May could not happen. Well, another reality that becomes clear as you go on reading in Mark is that Jesus also has power over illness and death. 
I counted nine specific in instances where he heals sick people and even raises the dead. And one example would be impressive. Nine would be very impressive. But Mark actually tells us a whole town came to Jesus and he healed many. It's not, we're not told how many, but we're told many. Now, one instance, um, there's a man named Jairus who comes along to Jesus and he's asking for his help because his daughter is very sick. Now, as Jesus goes with the man to the daughter, on his way, a woman who'd been su suffering from a discharge of blood for 12 years goes up to him, touches him in the hustle and bustle of a, cra of a, clou of a crowd, rather, and is immediately healed. She spent all her money on the doctors to try and get healed, but actually she got worse. As soon as she, she touches Jesus' clothes, she's healed. Now, during this episode, the daughter of Jairus has actually died, and it all looks over. But Jesus goes to her, takes her by the hand, tells her to get up, and she does. Jesus raises her back to life. Now, that is pretty amazing, isn't it? Jesus, on his way to go and heal an ill girl, someone who uh, goes and touches his cloak is healed amazingly, miraculously. Unintentionally, Jesus heals someone on his way to go and heal someone else. Oh, and then he goes and raises the dead girl. God's king, Jesus, has power and authority over sickness and death, and that's a very good thing. Remember, we're looking at Jesus to see what God's kingdom is like, what's it going to be like. If Jesus has power over sickness and death, then there will be no illness, there will be no suffering, and there will be no death in God's kingdom. Now, there are so many illnesses in our world today. You could ask one of the medics, perhaps, after this, how many illnesses there are. I couldn't count. Whether it's malaria or cancer, lots of people do get really sick. And even if you don't uh, get ill with uh, something like that, you can be sure that one day, whether it's now or in the future, one day you will end up dying. Now, I googled this, and it's not a particularly pleasant thing to Google, but I did. Uh, apparently, 55.3 million people die each year in the whole world. That's about 151,600 each day, or that's 6,316 each hour, which amounts to about 1.8 every second. And that is shocking, isn't it? Death is absolutely shocking. You'll know this if you've ever been to a funeral and seen the mourning for a loved one. Death hurts. It cuts us off from the people we really love. But as a culture, we tend to try and pretend that we don't die. Actually, it's something other people do, but it's not, it's not going to happen to us. But if we're honest, it is one of our biggest issues. In fact, it's probably our biggest issue. So therefore, if God's king, Jesus, has power over death and over illness and over suffering, then we can be sure God's kingdom will not have any death, illness, or suffering in it. There will be no heartbreaking news of cancer or another illness in God's kingdom. There'll be no funerals. Have you ever thought of that? No funerals in God's kingdom. People, God's people, will live with him forever. And again, if we were to look through Mark's gospel more, we'd see again and again what God's kingdom is like. There are two occasions where Jesus provides a massive feast for around 5,000 men the first time, which is probably around 15 to 20,000 people, including women and children, and then 4,000 men the next time. And he provides that using, first of all, five loaves and two fish, and second time with seven loaves and a few small fish. Now, apart from that being an amazing miracle, that is something that cannot just happen. Um, what's truly amazing about that is that Jesus is God's king who provides. He provides for the needs of his people. Now, throughout the generations, it's been the case, hasn't it, that we need to work in order to provide for our families and for ourselves. If we stop working, even in our Western culture where food is so readily available, we would soon stop having food on our tables. And for many in the world, that is a real concern, how to provide for themselves and their family. Well, the good news of God's kingdom is that Jesus the King is the provider. Just like a baby does absolutely nothing to receive the attention it needs or um, the food it needs, so too God's people 
will have everything they need provided for them and will be completely cared for by God. But most importantly, what is most amazing about God's kingdom by far is the good news that God himself will be there. God's people will be in a relationship with God. Those um, in God's kingdom will know the one true creator God and be able to speak freely to have a relationship with him. And how do we know that? Well, because Jesus came to deal with our broken relationship with God. You see, we all by nature have turned away from God. We've all sinned. We've all said to God, no thank you, I don't want to live with you in my life. I'm going to live how I want. And so our relationship with God is broken. If you notice, our world is broken, and that's a result of us turning our backs on God. But the amazing news is that Jesus repeatedly says he came to call sinners, to call people like us who have rejected God. And in fact, he explicitly states that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. How did he do this? Well, you see in Mark, Jesus did that on the cross. Jesus hanging on the cross took the punishment for our sin, our rejection of God, in order that we might be able to be restored to God. He did it so that we could be brought into God's kingdom and enjoy an eternity in perfect relationship with God the Father. Now, isn't that a relationship you really do yearn for? With a God who stops at nothing to rescue you. He even sent his own son to die for you in order that you might be rescued. He cares for you unlike anyone else, and he will care for you like en unlike anyone can ever care for you. And in God's kingdom, where Jesus is king, God's people will receive the blessing and comfort of that unique relationship with God. So I hope we're beginning to see how the kingdom of God is really good news. Jesus calls it good news. I think it really is good news. But just in case we're not getting the picture yet, I'd like you to imagine for a moment. You wake up one morning, and you flick on the BBC News. I don't know if you do this in your normal lives. You might. You flick on the BBC News, and you notice something quite peculiar. There are no reporters reporting about the latest victims of ISIS or the latest bombings in a European city. You walk into Bournemouth and you go to the hospital and you notice there's a very eerie silence. Nobody's there, no doctors, no nurses, no patients. In fact, all the hospital beds are empty. And then you decide to walk back over to Christchurch, Westbourne, and you look through the register for the funerals that have been held here. Only you keep flicking through, but you can't find any names. They're have been no funerals. And on your way back through Bournemouth, um, you head to the town centre, and you notice that all the cars are parked in people's driveways. No one's gone to work. You keep thinking to yourself, what on earth is happening? And as you begin to approach the square in Bournemouth, you see a hustle and bustle of thousands and thousands of people. In fact, the whole of Bournemouth, Westbourne, Paul and Christchurch are there having a huge feast. Now, you struggle your way down Commercial Road, and you manage to get at some point between the body shop and Boots, and you can see the square. And you stop, and you see God the Father in all his glory, with Jesus Christ, the King at his right-hand side, speaking, relating to people. And you see him beckoning you to come and join him. And everyone looks so happy. They look so content. Well, that's just a fraction of a picture of what God's kingdom really is like. The kingdom that, God, that Jesus revealed on his time on earth. A kingdom where there's no evil, where there's no suffering, illness, or disease, or death, where his people are completely provided for and cared for, and most importantly, where they will be in perfect relationship with God the Father through his King, Jesus. That's the reality of God's kingdom. And that's what Jesus showed in his life and ministry. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's just pie in the sky. That's just pie in the sky. How on earth could you believe that? Well, I would like to say to you, why not look at Jesus? Jesus showed that that is reality through his life and work. In fact, if you don't think that's good news, if that's not the world you want, I want to suggest you might need to check your pulse. 
But if this is such great news, if God's kingdom is so brilliant, why didn't Jesus just enforce it right there and then? We know our world today is so far from that um, list of amazing traits that God's kingdom is. Well, with Jesus' physical presence, his life, the kingdom of God was near, as it says in verse 15, but it wasn't fully here. It's not been fully established on earth yet, as we know. That will happen only when Jesus returns in glory. But still, why the delay? Why hasn't he come back? It's been 2,000 years. And the answer to that is it's because Jesus wants as many people to be there as possible. He wants people like you and like me to be in his kingdom. After all, it's a great thing. It would be a shame not to have anyone in it. And we'll see next week that Jesus was calling people to himself. And actually, this is what God has been doing through the generations, um, bringing people into relationship with him. Since Jesus' time on earth, God's kingdom is very much here in the sense that generations and generations have been turning to Christ, putting their faith in the King Jesus. In fact, every local church is a tiny fragment of God's kingdom where God's people can be found. And God's in the business of gathering more and more people into his kingdom. Just by way of an example, in China, where decades ago it might have been rare to have many Christians, there are now around 67 to 100 million Christians. 67 to 100 million because they can't actually count how many there are. And in Iran, where it's actually illegal to be a Christian, they have the largest growing underground church. God is still in the business of gathering people into his kingdom and he will fully establish it when Jesus returns. The kingdom is very near because it's the next final act of God. But what's the right response to this amazing news? If God's kingdom is this brilliant, how do we respond? We'll have a look at verse 15 again. I'll read that for us. I've now turned to Malachi, so I will read it in a moment. Mark 1, 15. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The right response is to repent and to believe. Now, repent just means turning from the wrong direction and back to the right one. You're going down one direction, you realize it's the wrong direction, and you do a complete U-turn and go back in the right direction. And belief, in this context, is just what you turn to. Here it's the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. It's Jesus Christ, the King himself. So repenting and believing the good news will mean stopping living for ourselves, for our own kingdom, what we want out of life, and instead turning to Jesus, submitting to his rule, and living for the impending kingdom. Those of us who are already trusting in Jesus, it's very easy, isn't it, just to let this verse wash over us. Repent and believe the good news, and you think, oh yeah, yeah, I've done that, I've done that, great, tick box, done that, it's a tick box exercise, thank you Jesus, great, I'll see you when you return, but for now, what am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to go and do this. But no, actually, repent and believe are both present tense imperatives. I had to check what that meant. But I think it means something like, it's not a one-time act. We need to continue doing it. In fact, you could read verse 15 as saying, repent and believe, and continue repenting and believing until Jesus returns, until God's kingdom returns. So they're not momentary acts. They're a full life, it's a full life of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith should um, affect every aspect of our lives. The Christian life, according to Jesus here, is a continual practice of turning back to him, submitting to him and his kingdom. But what will that actually look like in our lives? Well, to start with, once we realize that Jesus' kingdom is the best news ever, for the reasons we've thought of so far, what, that, that it's actually what we really want and need, a place where there is no evil, no suffering or illness, no death, completely cared for and provided for, and in a perfect relationship with God the Father. Once we realize that, that it's better than anything this world could possibly offer, then that will lead us to turn back to Jesus, surely. So repenting and believing will mean giving our whole lives to Jesus the King, submitting to his rule. 
It will mean following him no matter the cost. It will mean not being ashamed of the gospel and the Bible's teaching on marriage or the fact that sin is really a problem for us and for the world. It will mean not turning our backs on Jesus if our colleagues at work mock us for living the Christian life. It may even mean losing your job because you refuse to fiddle with the tax return that your boss was so eager to meddle with. It will mean not exchanging Jesus and the coming kingdom for our rep reputation amongst our friends at school in the playground or at work or even our social standing amongst our neighbors. If we're not prepared to do this, then it does beg the question, doesn't it? Have we really repented and believed in the good news? Are we really living for Jesus? Do you see, repenting and believing will mean constantly coming back to Jesus and setting our hope back on him and his coming kingdom. Every time we, every time we d decide to turn away and wander off in pursuit of other things. It will affect every aspect of our lives, where we choose to work, a job where we'll get paid loads and loads, or a job where we'll still be able to help serve at the local Sunday school, or reading our Bible with our friends. It will affect who we choose to marry, whether we marry a Christian or not, where to live, not just to up sticks and leave your church family and move somewhere else where, whenever something better comes up. Or it might actually mean uprooting your life and going and serving in a church elsewhere so that the good news of God's kingdom might be heard. Living our lives solely based on Jesus' coming kingdom will mean actually making it to church even when we are tired, even when we can't really be bothered so that we can then go and encourage each other's and keep living for the kingdom. Repenting and believing the good news of Jesus' kingdom will mean actually battling with our sinful nature. It will mean praying to God for help to stop us hitting the roof every time your spouse asks you if you've done the washing of the dishes. It will mean working hard not to hate the colleague that you really just don't particularly like. It will mean not blaming God for the things you don't have in your life that you would really like. And rather knowing that through Jesus you have everything you could possibly need. Ultimately, repenting and believing will mean letting Jesus be the king of your life and not yourself. If you've never asked for God's forgiveness and for Jesus to be your king, or what that would actually mean, why not, as Sam mentioned, why not come along to CE on the 5th of November, just for the first week, and see what actually Jesus was like, see what he is like? Better still, why not speak to Sam or me or someone else afterwards and ask them, what does it actually mean to live for Jesus? Or imagine Jeff, for instance. He's got a very well-paid job. He loves watching the digits on his bank balance increase each month. In fact, he's saving up for a second home. He's looking forward to building up a mini heaven on earth for him and his family. Jeff is living for the luxuries of this world. He set his hope on all that this world can offer, but not the coming kingdom. For Jeff to repent and believe the good news would mean realigning his heart to the coming kingdom, to stop living for the things of this life and rather for the things to come. You can imagine him now spending more time opening his Bible, checking he is living in line with God's will. He might start thinking, well, how can I help best at church? He might start investing more in that work than for his own comfort and leisure. He might even be going alongside, going out, knocking on his neighbor's door saying, have you heard about the good news of the kingdom of God? He might actually go out and do that. Now, it's very easy to point the finger at Jeff, isn't it? I'll check him working out and saving up for a nice new house. But actually, you and I may have the exact same mentality. For the person in a normal uh, home uh, who um, lives in a normal townhouse or the newlywed couple in a two-bedroom flat, it's very easy to live for the future hope of having a very comfortable, nice house. The future hope of getting that house you want, that car, that cat, that dog, maybe a few children. It's so easy to live for these things and make them our number one priority. Now, please do not get me wrong. These are all very good gifts that God loves to give us. But the problem comes when we make them our king and 
reject the coming kingdom and the truth about Jesus the King, which is better by far. Repentance and belief would mean turning back to Jesus and making the coming of his kingdom the most important thing in our lives. We've said that. You can imagine the newlywed couple or the single guy deciding to get up over a weekend to help with a Sunday school or deciding to ask their friend if they would like to read that Bible with them with the hope that they would come to know the truth of God's kingdom. That might be something of what repenting and believing and living for God's kingdom would look like. Or imagine George, the newly converted Christian. His life used to be about the weekends, how much fun he could have, all those films he could watch, all those games he could play, and all the fun he could have in life. But since becoming a Christian, he's begun to make it a priority to come to church and the midweek group so that he can better know Jesus. In fact, he started to even read the Bible outside of church himself, and he's hungry for it, so hungry that he's now concerned for his non-Christian mates, and he's planning on even asking one of them to read it with them. George's new activity reflects his change of heart. He's constantly turning back to Jesus and letting the certainty of God's coming kingdom dictate his life in the here and now. And what might it look for us as a church family, part of Christ's body, to be living, to be repenting and turning back for the kingdom of God? Well, imagine if you're a newcomer. In fact, if you are a newcomer, you can test this afterwards. Imagine you walk through, past the welcome desk and into the church. You sit down before the service and someone comes alongside you and starts chatting to you. After the service, they invite you through for a coffee next door and they start asking you about, what did you make about Jesus being God's king? You sense that they genuinely are keen to tell you the good news about God's coming kingdom. They even offer to take you out for a coffee and read a bit of the Bible with you. That might be something like a church that is keen to be living for, the, for God's kingdom and keen for others to come into it. I take it we'll only be keen like that as a church if we're committed to knowing our Bibles better. I know I could. And being disciplined in growing in our relationship with Jesus. That will give us the hunger to be living for God's coming kingdom. A good question for us might be, do I really read my Bible with a view to growing, to knowing the King, to aligning my heart and my life to Jesus, and so that I can then encourage others to do the same? Now, it's great to think these things through, isn't it? What it will actually look like to live for God's coming kingdom. And we could go on and on and on. But I hope we've seen that repenting and believing the good news is not just a one-time act that you did 25 years ago or you did a few months ago. But actually, it's a continual cycle of life for the Christian. It's not even just a change of mind or a way of thinking. It is to fully stake your hope completely on God's King Jesus and his coming kingdom. That's what the disciples did, as we'll see next week. But it does mean to con constantly be realigning our wills and giving our allegiance to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in every aspect of our lives. Now, it would be tragic, wouldn't it, if we missed the urgency to repent and believe. If we went away from here thinking and just conceptualizing about it, Jesus says the only right response to the amazing good news that we thought of earlier, the amazing news of God's kingdom, is to repent and believe, to just turn and accept him and the kingdom. And we need to do that before he returns, don't we? And if we have, we need to continue believing and turning to him for the rest of our time on earth. Now, if this is all new to you, then I'd encourage you to keep looking at the person of Jesus. Maybe even read one of the Gospels or sign up to see, speak to Sam or I afterwards. But keep looking at Jesus to see what God's kingdom is like and why it's really worth living for him. But the time to decide whether or not to submit to Jesus' kingdom and his coming kingdom is running out. Jesus could return tomorrow morning. He's given us the good news, a place where there will be no evil, where there will be no suffering, death, or illness, where we'll be fully provided for, and where, most importantly, we will be in perfect relationship with God the Father. And he says, very simply, the right response to that is to repent 
and believe the good news. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have this amazing news which you long and have shown to us. Father, thank you that God's kingdom is a place unlike this earth, Lord, where there will be no death, where there will be no suffering, where there will be no hurt, there will be perfect relationship with you. And Father, we praise you that you've revealed that to us through the person of Jesus. Father, please help us to keep turning back to Jesus the King and accepting him and his rule in our lives, Lord. Please help us be prepared to live for this amazing coming kingdom and not to be sidetracked by the worries or pleasures of this life. And Father, please, if we're thinking for this for the first time, please, Lord, would you reveal more to us of what your coming kingdom is. Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.